in this chamber than I paid when I was in his class back in 1977. But you don't need a law, Harvard Law School degree to understand what utter nonsense that argument is and where it could take us if we followed it to a logical conclusion. The framers wrote impeachment into the Constitution precisely because they were worried about the abuse of presidential power. And if an abuse of power is what the framers had in mind when they crafted impeachment, then the two questions remaining in our deliberations are simple. Did President Trump abuse his power, and should he be removed from office? The House managers had presented a compelling case that the President did pressure Ukraine to announce politically motivated investigations. Again, a number of my Republican against Donald Trump's political interest. And despite his efforts to cover it up, he got caught. Now, each one of us must vote, guilty or not guilty. I will vote to convict the President because I swore an oath to do impartial justice. And the evidence proves the charges against him are true. There must be consequences for abusing the power of the presidency to solicit foreign interference in our elections. If the Senate fails to hold him accountable, we will be setting a da dangerous precedent. We will be giving the green light to foreign adversaries and future presidents that this kind of behavior is okay. I will vote to convict the president because it is the Senate's constitutional re responsibility to uphold this bedrock American principle that no one is above the law not even the president, and especially not the president. Thank you, Madam President, and I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Montana. Thank you, Madam President. I'm going to read a statement, and then I'm going to go back through the information that I used to make a decision to be able to write this statement. Montana sent me to the U.S. Senate to hold government accountable. I fought to allow this trial to include documents and testimony from witnesses with firsthand knowledge and allegations against the President, regardless of whether they were incriminating or exculpatory, so that the Senate could make its decision based on the best information available. Unfortunately, my Republican colleagues and the administration blocked this information, robbing the American people, the American people of their legitimate right to hold their elected officials accountable. Based on the evidence that was available to me at this trial, I believe President Trump abused his power by withholding military aid from an ally for personal political gain, and that he obstructed legitimate oversight by a co-equal branch of government. It is a sad day for this country, and for all Americans who believe that no one, not even the President of the United States, is above the law. So how did I get to this point? Well, just a little over two weeks ago, we came into this chamber and we started hearing testimony. That testimony resulted in these two notebooks full of notes, because quite frankly, the House managers laid out a compelling case. The defense made their arguments, but the, 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 the case of the House was incredibly compelling. And impeachment is a solemn time. It's not something we should be taking Without, without the deepest and most serious consideration, I compare it to a vote to send our people to war. 
But in this particular case, there was very little transparency and none, if the president would have had it his way, of information coming to this body during this trial. This, in fact, is the shortest impeachment trial of a president ever. And if we're going to have information to good, make good decisions, and I've always said if you have good information, you can make good decisions, the president really needed to open up and cooperate just a little bit. This is the first time ever that we've had a trial with no witnesses and no documents, a trial in the Senate, no information from the executive branch. And, and I get it. I get executive privilege, and I think there are times when executive privilege has got to be used because the information is sensitive. But I've got to tell you, the Williams letter is a prime example. I went down to the skiff. I read it. I've got to tell you something. If there's something in there that needs to be classified, you've got me. The information in that letter was information that I knew before I went in the skiff. And it's the same with many of the emails, if not all of the emails, that the president has requested to be classified and kept away from this body and kept away from the press. And that's not the way this democracy should work. It should be open. If things are done, the people should be allowed to know. Now, there are moments in time when documents have to be classified on sensitive information. But I am here to tell you I've seen none of that. And I think many of the FOIA requests that have been brought forth shows heavily redacted email messages, and when we find out what's really in them, there was no need for that redaction. So when it comes to the obstruction of Congress, the Article II impeachment, I don't think there's any doubt that the President obstructed our ability, the Senate of the United States, to do its job as a co-equal branch to make sure that the executive branch is being honest and forthright. Now let's talk about the abuse of power. There's a lot of information that was brought forth during this, this trial about what the president did. It's been stated many times on this floor over the last nearly three weeks. The fact the matter, the fact the matter is there is little doubt that the president withheld aid to an ally for the purpose of creating a position where they had to do an investigation if they were going to get that money, or at least announce that investigation, on a United States citizen who happened to be a political foe to corrupt our next election. There's no doubt about that. Many of the folks who are not going to vote for impeachment have already said that the president has wrongdoing, but it's not an impeachable offense. And I am here to tell you, if anybody in this country, especially the president of the United States, corrupts an election, and that's not an impeachable offense for the President of the United States, I don't know what is. Fair elections are a foundational issue for this country. And to corrupt our elections is something that we need to hold people accountable of if they've done it. And I will tell you that the prosecution proved that point beyond the shadow of a doubt. I would also say that if you take a look at the episodes that happened before we got to this point that have actually nothing to do with the impeachment, but it does have something to do with the point that the defense said about folks have been calling for impeachment since this president got in office, I offer you this. Freedom of speech is something that is very important to this country. And I can tell you that when the president first got into office and he got in a fight with the prime minister of Australia and the prime minister of Sweden and got in a fight with the prime minister of the best friend the United States has in Canada, I was critical of the president. When the president pushed back on NATO and embraced every dictator in the world from Putin to Erdogan to Xi to Kim Jong-un, yes, I was critical of the president. When the president pulled troops out of northern Syria and left our allies, the Kurd, on the field alone, I was critical of the president. 
And when the president did his trade wars that put American farmers, family farmers, and Main Street businesses at risk of closure, I was critical of the president. And we should be. That had nothing to do with the impeachment, but it absolutely has everything to do with our freedom of speech. And today, tomorrow I should say, we're going to vote on whether to convict or acquit the president on taking taxpayer dollars and withholding it to an ally who's at war with an adversary for his own personal and political good. And we're going to vote on whether to convict the president of withholding information from the entire executive branch and the only ones that testified were those patriotic Americans that defied his order. And we're going to vote whether he obstructed Congress. This is a no-brainer. He absolutely, unequivocally is guilty of both Article I and Article II of the impeachment. So the question is this. If it goes as predicted tomorrow and the president gets acquitted, where do we go from here? I am very concerned about where we go from here because the next president will use this precedence to not give any information to a co-equal branch of government when we question them. The next president will use this as, geez, if it's good for me in my election, it's good for the country, as Dershowitz said. So Katie bar the door. And as Chairman Schiff said yesterday, if you think this president's going to stop doing these actions, you're living on a different planet than I'm living on. This will empower him to do anything he wants. And at some point in time, if we want to listen to what the framers said, at some point in time, we're going to have to do our constitutional duty. It doesn't appear we're going to do it this time. I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Maine. Madam President, for more than 200 years after our Constitution was adopted, only one president faced an impeachment trial before the United States Senate. That was Andrew Johnson in 1868. But now we are concluding our second impeachment trial in just 21 years. While each case must stand on its own facts, this trend reflects the increasingly acrimonious partisanship facing our nation. The founders warned against excessive partisanship, fearing that it would lead to instability, injustice, and confusion ultimately posing a mortal threat to our free government. To protect against this, the founders constructed an elaborate system of checks and balances to prevent factions from sacrificing both the public good and the rights of other citizens. Impeachment is part of that elaborate system. The founders set a very high bar for its use, requiring that the president may only be removed by a two-thirds vote of the Senate. The framers recognized that in removing a sitting president, we would be acting against not only the office holder, but also the voters who entrusted him with that position. Thus, the Senate must consider whether misconduct occurred, its nature, and the traumatic and disruptive impact that removing a duly elected president would have on our nation. In the trial of President Clinton, I argued that in order to convict, we must conclude from the evidence presented to us with no room for doubt that our Constitution will be injured and our democracy suffer should the President remain in office one moment more. The House managers adopted a similar threshold 
when they argued that President Trump's conduct is so dangerous that he must not remain in power one moment longer. The point is, impeachment of a president should be reserved for conduct that poses such a serious threat to our governmental institutions as to warrant the extreme step of immediate removal from office. I voted to acquit President Clinton, even though the House managers proved to my satisfaction that he did commit a crime because his conduct did not meet that threshold. I will now discuss each of the articles. In its first article of impeachment against President Trump, the House asserts that the President abused the power of his presidency. While there are gaps in the record, some key facts are not disputed. It is clear from the July 25, 2019 phone call between President Trump and Ukrainian President Zelensky that the investigation into the Biden's activities requested by President Trump was improper and demonstrated very poor judgment. There is conflicting evidence in the record about the president's motivation for this improper request. The House managers stated repeatedly that President Trump's actions were motivated solely for his own political gain in the 2020 campaign. Yet the president's attorneys argued that the president had sound public policy motivations, including a concern about widespread corruption in Ukraine. Regardless, it was wrong for President Trump to mention former Vice President Biden on that phone call, and it was wrong for him to ask a foreign country to investigate a political rival. The House Judiciary Committee identified in its report crimes that it believed the president committed. Article 1, however, does not even attempt to assert that the president committed a crime. I sought to reconcile this contradiction between the report and the articles in a question I posed to the House managers, but they failed to address that point in their response. While I do not believe that the conviction of a president requires a criminal act, the high bar for removal from office is perhaps even higher when the impeachment is for a difficult to define non-criminal act. In any event, the House did little to support its assertion in Article 1 that the President will remain a threat to national security and the Constitution if allowed to remain in office. As I concluded in the impeachment trial of President Clinton, I do not believe that the House has met its burden of showing that the President's conduct, however flawed, warrants the extreme step of immediate removal from office. Nor does the record support the assertion by the House managers that the President must not remain in office one moment longer. The fact that the House delayed transmitting the articles of impeachment to the Senate for 33 days undercuts this argument. For all of the reasons I have discussed, I will vote to acquit on Article 1. Article 2 seeks to have the Senate convict the President based on a dispute over witnesses and documents between the legislative 
and executive branches. As a general principle, an objection or privilege asserted by one party cannot be deemed invalid, let alone impeachable, simply because the opposing party disagrees with it. Before the House even authorized its impeachment inquiry, it issued 23 subpoenas to current and former administration officials. When the House and the President could not reach an accommodation, the House failed to compel testimony and document production. The House actually withdrew a subpoena seeking testimony from Dr. Charles Kupperman, a national security aide, once he went to court for guidance. And the House chose not to issue a subpoena to John Bolton, the national security advisor whom the House has identified as the key witness. At a minimum, the House should have pursued the full extent of its own remedies before bringing impeachment charges, including by seeking the assistance of a neutral third party, the judicial branch. In making these choices, the House substituted its own political preference for speed over finality. The House managers described impeachment as a last resort for the Congress. In this case, however, the House chose to skip the basic steps of judicial adjudication and instead leapt straight to impeachment as the first resort. Therefore, I will vote to acquit on Article 2. Madam President, this decision is not about whether you like or dislike this president or agree with or oppose his policies or approve or disapprove of his conduct in other circumstances. Rather, it is about whether the charges meet the very high constitutional standard of treason bribery, or other high crimes or misdemeanors. It has been 230 years since George Washington first took the oath of office. And there are good reasons why during that entire time, the Senate has never removed a president. Such a move would not only affect the sitting president, but could have unpredictable and potentially adverse consequences for public confidence in our electoral process. It is my judgment that except when extraordinary circumstances require a different result, we should entrust to the people the most fundamental decision of a democracy, namely, who should lead their country. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President. Senator from New Jersey. Thank you very much. In, 17, in 1974, after the House Judiciary Committee voted to approve articles of impeachment against President Nixon, Chairman Peter Rodino of my home state of New Jersey, a lifelong Newark resident of my home city, who had been thrust into the high profile position only the previous year, returned to his office and called his wife. When she answered the phone, this chairman, this longtime congressman, broke down in tears and cried. 
46 years later, our nation has found itself under similar duress. And God, I agree with my fellow Newarker, impeaching a president is a profoundly sad time for our nation. It is a painful time, no matter what party, if you love your country, then this is heartbreaking. When we think about our history as Americans, so many of us have reverence for our founding fathers and our founding documents. They represented imperfect genius. We talk about the Declaration of Independence. We hail the Constitution. These documents literally bent the arc of not just our own history, but human history for democratic governance on the planet. And while these were milestones in the paths of our nation's relatively brief existence, the governing document that came before, between the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution is often overlooked, the Articles of Confederation. With the benefit of hindsight, it's easy to view the development of our nation as preordained, inevitable, as if it was an expected march towards the greatness we now collectively hail. That this was somehow a perfectly plotted path towards a more perfect union. But it wasn't. In 1787, as our founders gathered in Philadelphia, our fledgling country was at a crisis and at crossroads. And its future, like in so many moments of our past, was deeply uncertain. You see, when the framers designed our system of government in the Articles of, Co of Confederation, you could say they overcompensated. With the tyranny of King George, George III fresh in their minds, they created a government with power so diffuse and decentralized that nothing could really get done. Instead of one nation, we were operating essentially as 13 independent states. The federal government could not tax its citizens. It could not raise money. It lacked a judiciary and an executive branch. So when our framers arrived in Philadelphia in that hot summer, they would have to thread a difficult needle, providing for a strong central government that represented the people and one that also guarded against the corrupt tendencies that come when power is concentrated like they well knew was so in a monarchy. Our democratic republic was their solution. They needed a powerful executive, yes, but that executive needed guardrails and his power needed to be checked and balanced. So the framers created what we now almost take for granted, three co-equal branches of government, the legislative, executive, and judicial. Each branch would have the ability to check the power of the other branches to ensure, as James Madison so profoundly argued, that ambition would be made to counteract ambition. But this system of checks and balances was not enough for our founders, still reeling from their experiences under the oppressive rule of the king, many feared an unaccountable autocratic leader. And so the founders created a mechanism of last resort impeachment. George Mason prophetically asked the founders to wrestle with the concept of impeachment at the Constitutional Convention, saying, and I quote, shall any man be above justice? The founders answered that question with a resounding no. The Constitution made clear that any federal officers, even the president, would be subject to impeachment and removal. No one, no one, no one is above the law. This was seen as the ultimate safeguard. 
and it's only been invoked twice before in American history. This is the third. I sat in this very spot and listened to the evidence presented, honoring my oath to be objective. And based on the evidence that was presented in hour after hour after hour of presentations, I've concluded that the president, Donald John Trump, is guilty of committing high crimes and misdemeanors against the United States of America, against the people. I believe he abused the awesome power of his office for personal and political gain to pressure a foreign power to interfere in the most sacred institution of our democracy, our elections. He then engaged in a concerted, far-reaching, and categorical effort to cover up his transgressions and block any effort for the people's representatives to have at the truth. It brings me no satisfaction to come to this conclusion. I feel that sadness of my predecessor. But yet we have sworn oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. This is not a moment that should call for partisan passions. It is not a moment that we think of in the limitlessness, in the limitless, in the limitness of personal ambition. This is a patriotic moment. It's about putting principle of a party. It's about honoring this body and the Senate's rightful place in our constitutional system of checks and balance. It's about fulfilling the enormous trust the founders placed in this body as an impartial court of impeachment and a necessary check on what they foresaw as the potential for grave abuses by the executive. If we fail to hold this president accountable, then we fail the founders' intent. We fail our democracy. And I fear the injury that will result when our grandchildren and their children read about this chapter in the history books, a time far into the future when this president is a memory, along with those of us serving in this chamber, it will not be seen through the eye of politics or partisanship. They will read about how this body acted in their moment of constitutional crisis. And I fear that their unflinching eye at a time when the full body of evidence will be out in the public domain, they will see clearly how this body abdicated its constitutional responsibilities, surrendering them to partisan passions. They will read about how the Senate shut its doors to the truth, even though it was within easy reach. How for the first time in our history with impeachment proceedings for judges and for past presidents that the world's greatest deliberative body conducted an impeachment trial without demanding a single witness and without subpoenaing a single document. How even as new evidence during the trial continued to be uncovered, it re its members of this body failed to even view it. They failed to pursue even the faintest, with even the faintest effort, those things that would have easily and more perfectly revealed the breadth and the depth of the president's misconduct. We know across the street in the Supreme Court, the saying is that justice is blind. But that means that no one is above the law. It does not mean that this body should abdicate its responsibilities, that it should abandon its senses and even abandon common sense. If there is evidence that we know about that could speak beyond a reasonable doubt to this president's alleged crimes and misconducts, in, in misconduct, it makes no sense whatsoever 
that we should deny in this deliberative body the truth, the truth. This kind of willful ignorance, this metaphorical closing of our eyes and ears, it is a grave danger to any democracy. It is the rot from within when the ideals of truth and justice fall victim to the toxic tyranny of absolute partisanship. This president has claimed authoritarian power that our Constitution was explicitly designed to prevent. He has literally said that Article 2 allows him to do whatever he wants. And that outrageous statement tomorrow could be given life within this democracy. He has declared himself unaccountable to and above the law. He has shred the very governing ideals of this great republic. And we, the Senate, the body designed to check such abuses to power, that, quote, dignified, independent, unawed, and influenced tribunal, as Hamilton so famously wrote in Federalist Paper number 65, we have been enablers to this destructive instinct. This is a sad day. This is a sad moment in the history of this body and in our nation. And I fear that it is emblematic, that it is a symptom of deeper challenges to this nation, challenges that are being exploited by our enemies abroad and by opportunists here at home. The factionalism that our founders warned us of have deepened beyond mere partisanship to a self-destructive tribalism. The, and I quote, cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men and quote, seeking to subvert the power of the people as Washington predicted in his profound and prophetic farewell address, these powers have found their season to flourish here in our time. Many in our society now hate other Americans, not because of the content of their character or their virtue and values that they hold dear, but we as Americans now more and more see hate proliferating in our country between fellow Americans because of what party we belong to. We have failed to listen to the words that come out of each other's mouths, failed to listen to the ideals or the principles or the underlying facts because we now simply listen to peak to partisanship. This nation was founded with great sacrifice. The blood and sweat and tears of our ancestors gave life and strength to this nation. This is now being weakened and threatened by what our very first, first president warned us of. And so yes, today is a sad moment, but as we as a nation have never been defined by our darkest hours. We have always been defined by how we respond to our challenges, how we have refused to surrender to cynicism, how we've refused, refused to give in to despair. And, and so I fear, as senator after senator today gets up and speaks, I, I fear that mere words in this time are impotent and ineffective. It may mark where we as individuals stand for the record, but the challenge demands more from all of us in this time. We've already seen on this Senate floor that sound arguments have been dismissed as partisanship. We have heard speech after speech and seen how they will not cure this time. They will not save this republic from our deepening divides. So I ask what will? How? How do we heal? How do we meet this crisis? I know that this president is incapable of healing this nation. 
I, I've never seen a leader in high office ever take such glee in meanness. He considers it some kind of high badge of virtue in the way he demeans and degrades his political adversaries. He demonizes others, often the weak in our society. And I firmly believe that he has shown that he will even conspire with foreign nations to defeat his adversaries and then defend himself, not with any truth or transparency, but by trying to heighten and ignite even more partisan passions. And so the question is really, how, how do we heal this nation? How do we meet this challenge that is not embodied in any individual? It was a man far greater than me named Learned Hand who said, and I quote, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. No constitution, no law, no court can even do much to help it. The spirit of liberty is a spirit which is not too sure that it's right. The spirit of liberty is a spirit which seeks to understand the minds of other men and women. The spirit of liberty is the spirit which weighs the interests, their interests, alongside its own without bias. I continue to quote this great judge, our dangers, as it seems to me, are not from the outrageous, but from the conforming, not those who rarely and under the Lord glare of obliquity, obliquity upset our moral complacence or shock us with unaccustomed conduct, but from those, the mass of us, who take their virtues and their tastes like their shirts and their furniture from the limited patterns which the market offers. I love our nation's history, and I'm telling you right now, we have seen that the true test of our democracy will not come simply from the low actions from our leaders on most high. The true, true test of our democracy will not turn alone on the actions of this body, because presidents before and this body before have failed us in dark times. They failed the ideals of freedom when time and time again they defended slavery. This body has failed the ideals of liberty when time and time again it rejected civil rights. This body has failed the ideals in the past of equality when it voted down again and again suffrage for women. Lo, presidents before and the Senate before has failed this nation in the darkest of times. As the songs of my ancestors have said, our path has been watered with the tears and blood of ancestors. How do we heal? How do we move forward? I say on this dark day that the hope of this nation lies with its people. As Learned Hand said, the spirit of liberty is not embodied in the Constitution. Other nations have constitutions that have failed. The hope of this nation will always lie with its people. And so we will not be cured today. And I tell you, tomorrow's vote, it is a defeat but we as the people facing other defeats in this body, we must never be defeated. Just like they beat us down at Stonewall, they beat us back in Selma. The hope of this nation lies with the people who face defeats but must never be defeated. And so my prayer, for our republic now, yet in another crisis in the Senate, 
is that we cannot let this be leading us further and further into a treacherous time of partisanship and tribalism where we tear at each other, when we turn against each other, now is the time in America where we must begin in the hearts of people to turn to each other, to begin to find a way out of this dark time to a higher ground of hope. This is not a time to simply point blame at one side or another. This is a time to accept responsibility like our ancestors in the past so understood that change does not come from Washington, it must come to Washington. As I was taught as a boy, we didn't get civil rights because Strom Thurmond came to the Senate floor one day and pronounced that he'd seen the light. No, this body responded to the demands of people and now is a time that we must demand the highest virtues of our land and see each other for who we are, our greatest hope and our greatest promise. We are a weary people in America again. We are tired. We are frustrated. But we cannot give up. That flag over there, we who swear an oath to it, and don't just parrot words or say them with some kind of perfunctory obligation, but those who swear an oath to this nation must now act with a greater unyielding conviction. We must act to do justice. We must act to heal harms. We must act to walk more humbly. We must act to love one another unconditionally. And now, more than ever, perhaps we need to act in the words of a great abolitionist, a former slave, who in a dark, difficult time, when America was failing to live up to its promise, gave forth a sentiment in his actions captured in the poetry of Langston Hughes. He declared through his deed and through his work and through his sacrifice that America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. May we as a nation in this difficult time where we face the betrayal of a president, the surrender of obligation by a body, may we meet this time with our actions of goodwill of a commitment to love and to justice and to yet again elevating our country so that we too may be like it says in that great text, a light unto all nations. Thank you. President. Mr. President, Senator from Ohio. I'm here today to talk about the Senate trial and the factors I've considered in making my decision on the articles of impeachment from the House. I've now read hundreds of pages of legal briefs and memos, including the testimony of 17 witnesses. Here on the Senate floor, I've reviewed more than 190 witness videos and listened carefully to more than 65 hours of detailed presentations from both the House managers and from the President's legal team. As co-founder and co-chair of the Ukraine Caucus and someone who's proud to represent many Ukrainian Americans in Ohio, I've been active for the past several years in helping Ukraine as it has sought freedom and independence since the 2014 Revolution of Dignity that saw the corrupt Russian-backed government of Viktor Yanukovych replaced with pro-Western elected leaders. Since first seeing the transcript of the phone call between President Trump and President Zelensky four months ago, I've consistently said that the President asking Ukraine for an investigation of Joe Biden was inappropriate and wrong. I've also said since then that any actions taken by members of the administration or those outside the administration to try to delay military assistance or a White House meeting pending an investigation by Ukraine were not appropriate either. But while I don't condone this behavior, these actions do not rise to the level of removing President Trump from office and taking him off the ballot 
in a presidential election year that is already well underway. I first look to the fact that the founders meant for impeachment of a president to be extremely rare, reserved for only, and I quote, treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors, end quote. Any fair reading of what the founders meant in the Constitution and in the Federalist Papers in the context of history and just plain common sense makes it clear that removing a duly elected president demands that those arguing for conviction meet a high standard. As an example, for good reason, there's never been a presidential impeachment that didn't allege a crime. In the Clinton impeachment, the independent counsel concluded that President Clinton committed not one, but two crimes. In this case, no crime is alleged. Let me repeat, in the two articles of impeachment that came over to us from the House, there is no criminal law violation alleged. Although I don't think that that's always necessary, there could be circumstances where a crime isn't necessary in an impeachment. Without a crime, it's even a higher bar for those who advocate for a conviction. And that high bar is not met here. What's more, even though it was delayed, the president ultimately did provide the needed military assistance to Ukraine. And he provided it before the September 30 budget deadline. And the requested investigations by Ukraine were not undertaken. It's an important point to make. The aid went, the investigations did not occur. The military assistance is particularly important to me as a strong supporter of Ukraine. In fact, I was one of those senators who fought to give President Obama and his administration the authority to provide badly needed lethal military assistance to Ukraine in response to the Russian aggression that came right after the Revolution of Dignity in 2014. I must say, I strongly urge the Obama administration to use that authority. And like Ukraine, I was deeply disappointed when they did not. I strongly supported President Trump's decision to change course and provide that assistance shortly after he came into office. While visiting Ukrainian troops on the front lines in the Donbas region of Ukraine, I've seen firsthand how much those soldiers need the military assistance President Trump alone has provided. Beyond whether the president's conduct met the high bar of impeachment, there is also the underlying issue of the legitimacy of the House impeachment process. The House Democrats sent the Senate a flawed case built on what respected George Washington University constitutional law professor Jonathan Turley calls, quote, the shortest proceeding with the thinnest evidentiary record and the narrowest grounds ever used to impeach a president, end quote. Instead of using the tools available to compel the administration to produce documents and witnesses, the House followed a self-imposed and entirely political deadline for voting on the articles of impeachment before Christmas. After the rush vote, the House then inexplicably stalled, keeping those articles from being delivered here in the Senate for 28 days, time they could have used to subpoena witnesses and resolve legitimate disagreements about whether evidence was privileged or not. They didn't even bother to subpoena witnesses. They then wanted the Senate to subpoena for them. The House process was also lacking in fundamental fairness and due process in a number of respects. It is incomprehensible to me that the President's counsel did not have the opportunity to cross-examine fact witnesses and that the House selectively leaked deposition testimony from closed door sessions. Rushing an impeachment case through the House without due process and giving the Senate a half-baked case to finish sets a very dangerous precedent. If the Senate were to convict, it would send the wrong message and risk making this kind of quick partisan impeachment in the House a regular occurrence moving forward. That would be terrible for the country. Less than a year ago, Speaker Nancy Pelosi said, and I quote, Impeachment is so divisive to the country that unless there's something so compelling and overwhelming and bipartisan, I don't think we should go down that path." End quote. She was right. It's better to let the people decide 
Early voting has already started in some states, and the Iowa caucuses occurred last night. Armed with all the information, we should let the voters have their say at the ballot box. During the last impeachment 21 years ago, now House Manager of Congressman Jerry Nadler said, and I quote, there must never be a narrowly voted impeachment or an impeachment substantially supported by one of our major political parties and largely opposed by the other. Such an impeachment would lack legitimacy, end quote. In this case, the impeachment wasn't just substantially supported by Democrats, it was only supported by Democrats. In fact, a few Democrats actually voted with all the Republicans to oppose the impeachment. Founder Alexander Hamilton feared that impeachment could easily fall prey to partisan politics. That's exactly what happened here, with the only purely partisan impeachment in the history of our great country. For all these reasons, I'm voting against the Articles of Impeachment tomorrow. It's time to move on, and to move on to focus on bipartisan legislation to help the families that we represent. Unlike the House, the Senate is blocked from conducting its regular business during impeachment. My colleague from New Jersey asked a moment ago, how do we heal? How do we heal the wounds? Our country is divided, and I think the impeachment is further divided an already polarized country. I think we heal in part by surprising the people and coming out from our partisan corners and getting stuff done, stuff that they care about, that affects the families we were sent here to represent. While in the impeachment trial, we were prevented from doing the important legislative work our constituents expect, like passing legislation to lower prescription drug costs, like rebuilding our crumbling roads and bridges, like addressing the new addiction crisis, the combination of synthetic opioids like fentanyl and crystal meth, pure crystal meth coming from Mexico. It's an opportunity for us to strengthen our economy with better skills training, including passing legislation to give workers the skills they need to meet the jobs that are out there. Those are just a few ideas that are ready to go. Ideas the President supports, Republicans support, Democrats support. I've been working on bipartisan initiatives like the JOBS Act to provide that needed skills training. The Restore Our Parks Act to do the infrastructure that's crumbling in our national parks. The Energy Savings and Industrial Competitive Act, which promotes energy efficiency, something we should be able to agree on across the aisle. All of these have been sitting idle this year as we have grappled with impeachment. How do we heal? How do we heal the wounds? Well, in part, let's do it by working together to pass legislation people care about. Back home, I have seen that the impeachment process has indeed further divided an already polarized country. A conviction in the Senate, removing Donald Trump from office and taking his name off the ballot would dangerously deepen that growing rift. That's one reason I'm glad we're not likely to see a conviction because I do care about our country and bringing it together. Instead, my hope is that lessons have been learned, that we can heal some wounds for the sake of the country, that we can turn to the bipartisan work most Americans expect us to do, and that we can allow American voters, exercising the most important constitutional check and balance of all, to have their say in this year's presidential election. I believe this is what the Constitution requires and what the country needs. I yield back my time. Mr. President. Senator from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, as I rise today to discuss this impeachment trial, I'm reminded of an inscription above the front door of the finance building in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania from the 1930s. Here is the inscription, quote, all public service is a trust given in faith and accepted in honor. I believe that President Trump and every public official in America must earn that trust every day. That sacred trust is given to us, as the inscription says, in faith by virtue of our election. The question for the president and every public official is this. Will we accept this trust 
by our honorable conduct. The trust set forth in the inscription is an echo of Alexander Hamilton's words in Federalist Number 65, where Hamilton articulated the standard for impeachment as, quote, offenses which proceed from the misconduct of public men, or in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust, unquote. Over the past two weeks, I've listened carefully to the arguments put forward by the President's defense lawyers and the House managers. In light of the substantial record put forth by the managers in this case, I've determined that the managers have not only met, but exceeded their burden of proof. President Trump violated his duty as a public servant by corruptly abusing the, his power to solicit foreign interference in the 2020 election. And by repeatedly obstructing Congress's constitutionally based investigation into his conduct. President Trump's clearly established pattern of conduct indicates that he will continue to be, quote, a threat to national security and the Constitution if allowed to remain in office, unquote. For these reasons, I will vote guilty on both Article I and Article II. This impeachment was triggered by the President's conduct. We're here because the President abused his power, the awesome power of his office, to demand that an ally investigate a political opponent, proving his contempt for the Constitution and his duties as a public official. The House managers provided substantial evidence of wrongdoing. First, as to Article I regarding abuse of power, many of the facts here are undisputed. For example, there is no dispute that the President has said, when referring to the Constitution itself, quote, Article I or Article II allows me to do whatever I want, unquote. So said the President of the United States of America. Then he withheld congressionally authorized military assistance to Ukraine in a White House meeting that Ukrainian President Zelensky, a meeting with President Zelensky, and assistance and conditioned that military assistance, I should say, and the meeting on Ukraine announcing investigations into Vice President Biden and his son, as well as a debunked conspiracy theory about the 2016 election interference. Of the, 20, the July 25th phone call in which President Trump asked President Zelensky, quote, to do us a favor, though, after Zelensky brought up in the conversation military assistance, that evidence is compelling, evidence of wrongdoing. The President reiterated on the White House lawn on October 3rd, Ukraine, quote, before adding that China should also, quote, start an investigation into the Bidens, unquote. President Trump's own politically appointed ambassador to the European Union, Gordon Sondland, explicitly testified that the meeting and the assistance were conditioned on announcing, announcing the investigations. The President's defense lawyers first ins insisted on this floor that he, quote, did absolutely nothing wrong, unquote. But later, after even Republican senators would not make that claim, the new justification for his misconduct was, quote, corruption and, quote, burden sharing, unquote. If the President was so concerned about corruption in Ukraine, why did he dismiss one of our best corruption-fighting diplomats, Marie Yovanovitch? The certified that
2018, only to delay it in 2019 after Joe Biden announced his run for president. If there were legitimate foreign policy concerns, the president would not have been interested in pursuing investigations based on, as Dr. Fiona Hill testified, a, quote, fictional narrative that is being perpetrated and propagated by the Russian security services, unquote, to raise doubts about Russia's own culpability in the 2016 election interference and to harm the relationship between the United States and Ukraine. Furthermore, as the President's defense team would have us believe that, that he legitimately asserted executive privilege over the House's well-founded impeachment inquiry, despite the fact that he never actually asserted a privilege over a single document or witness. Rather, he issued a blanket directive in which he refused to cooperate entirely with the House investigation. This action not only obstructed the House's constitutional responsibility of oversight, it also sought to cover up the President's corrupt abuse of power. At the time of the drafting of the Constitution, the framers' understanding of, quote, high crimes and misdemeanors, unquote, was informed by centuries of English legal precedent. This understanding was reflected in the language of Federalist Number 65 that I referred to earlier regarding, quote, an abuse or violation of some public trust, unquote. Based on this history, both chambers of Congress have consistently interpreted, quote, high crimes and misdemeanors, unquote, broadly to mean, quote, serious violations of the public trust, unquote. The President's defense lawyers argued that impeachment requires the violation of a criminal statute to be constitutionally valid. This argument is offensive, dangerous, and not supported by historical precedent, credible scholarship, or common sense about the sacred notion of the public trust. When applying the impeachment standard of a, quote, abuse or violation of some public trust, it is clear that President Trump's conduct exceeded that standard. Any effort to corrupt our next election must be met with swift accountability as provided for in the impeachment clause in the Constitution. There is no other remedy to constrain a president who has acted time and again to advance his personal interests over those of the nation. Presented in this impeachment, in an ongoing, has engaged in ongoing efforts to solicit foreign interference in our elections. As the Washington Post reported on September the 21st, in a story written by three reporters who have covered the president for several years, the president's conduct on the Ukraine phone call revealed a quote. Washington Post, a, quote, president convinced of his own invincibility, apparently willing and even eager to wield the vast powers of the United States to taint a political foe and confident that no one could hold him back, unquote. This president will abuse his power again. Now, at the outset of this trial, and throughout the proceedings, Senate Democrats and 75 percent of the American people have repeatedly called for relevant witnesses and relevant documents to be subpoenaed to ensure a full and fair trial for all parties. For example, we saw a testimony from former National Security Advisor John Bolton, whose unpublished manuscript indicates that the President explicitly told Bolton that he wanted to continue the delay in military assistance to Ukraine until it announced the political investigations he was seeking. Fifty-one Senate Republicans refused to examine this 
or other relevant evidence, thereby rigging this trial to the benefit of the president. Fair trials have witnesses and documents. Cover-ups have neither. grave presidential abuse of power. It's about our democracy, the sanctity of our elections, and the very values that the founders agreed should guide our nation. I go back to the beginning in that inscription. Quote, all public service is a trust given in faith and accepted in honor. President Trump dishonored that public trust and thereby abused his power for personal political gain in order to, to prevent continuing interference in our upcoming election and blatant obstruction of congress i will vote guilty on both articles mr president i would yield the floor Mr. President. Senator from Arkansas. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today to address the topic that has consumed this body for the past several weeks, which is, of course, the impeachment trial of the President of the United States. After the passage of two impeachment articles in the House, Speaker Pelosi waited nearly a month to transmit the articles to the Senate. Once she finally did, the trial took precedent, and the wheels were set in motion to conduct the proceedings and render a verdict. Since it became clear that the House would vote to impeach the President, I have taken my constitutional duty to serve as a juror in the impeachment trial with the seriousness and the attention that it demands. In light of the extensive coverage this situation received, it was impossible not to take notice of the process that unfolded in the House over the course of its investigation. Its inquiry was hasty, flawed, and clearly undertaken under partisan pretenses. Having rushed to impeach the President ahead of an arbitrary deadline, as well as failing to provide adequate opportunities for the President to defend himself the impeachment investigation in this case specifically was, in, was contrived at least partially and was a vehicle to fulfill the fierce desire among the many president's detractors that has existed since before he was even sworn in to remove him from office. Be that as it may, the Constitution makes clear that the Senate has a duty to try all, of in, all the impeachments. As such, the chief concern I had, as I know many of my colleagues also shared, was for the process in this body to be fair. It was clear to me that what transpired in the House was incredibly partisan and unfair. I believe the Senate must and would rise to the occasion to conduct a trial that was fair, respectful, and faithful to the design intent of our founders. I believe that the organizing resolution that we passed was sufficient in establishing a framework for the trial and also would address the outstanding issues at the appropriate times. Throughout the course of the trial, I stayed attentive and engaged, taking in the arguments and the evidence presented to the Senate, which included the testimony of over a dozen witnesses and thousands of documents as part of the House investigation. 
The House impeachment managers were emphatic that their case against the President was overwhelming, uncontested, convincing, and proven. The President's counsel made an equally forceful case in his defense, countering the claims made by the House and underscoring the grounds on which the Senate should reject the articles and, by necessity, the attempt to expel him from office and a future ballot. Based on the work done by the House, or maybe more accurately, the work not done and inherently flawed and partisan nature of the product it presented to the Senate, I was skeptical that it could prove its case and convince anybody, apart from the President's longtime most severe critics, that his behavioral merited removal from office. After two weeks of the proceedings in the Senate, my assessment of the situation has not been swayed, nor has it changed. That's why I will vote to acquit the President and reject the weaponization of Congress's authority to impeach the duly elected President of the United States. To be clear, the partisan nature of this impeachment process potentially sets the stage for more impeachments along strictly partisan lines, a development that would be terrible for our country. The Constitution lays out justifications for impeachment, which include, quote, treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, end quote. As a United States Senator, there's perhaps no more important decision that I'm asked to make aside from voting to send Americans to war. That's exactly why I treated this impeachment trial with the gravity and the thoughtfulness I believe that it deserved. The accusations explicitly made by the House impeachment managers and echoed by some on the other side that the Senate is engaging in a cover-up is wrong on the merits and further drags this process down into the rhetoric of partisan political warfare. I regret that it's descended to such a place. Fulfilling my constitutional obligation after drawing my own conclusions is far from a cover-up. The attempt to turn the impeachment power into a weapon of political convenience will be far more damaging than any other aspect of this chapter in our nation's history. At the end of the day, this partisan deficient process yielded a product built on inadequate foundation, in addition to being clearly motivated by the desire to remove the president, who some vocal activists have viewed as illegitimate since the election day in 2016. Not even a year ago, Speaker Pelosi was still attempting to stem the push for impeachment within her own party, arguing that, I quote, impeachment is so divisive to the country that unless there's something so compelling and overwhelming and bipartisan, I don't think we should go down that path, end quote. She was right. And this impeachment process has failed by each of these metrics. It has further divided the country. The case is certainly not overwhelming. And it's been anything but bipartisan. In fact, the vote against impeaching the President in the House was bipartisan. And as a result, Senate of Senate rules But as the trial reaches its conclusion, I believe we must move on and return to doing the work of trying to get things done for the American people. The average Arkansan, like many other Americans, is looking for results and asking how the elected leaders they have chosen are trying to help make their lives better and move our country forward. They are not interested in the political games and theater and that have consumed much of Washington since September. It is my hope that we will return to that real pressing work in short order. In just a few months, the voters of this country will get to decide who they prefer to lead our country. I trust them to make that decision. And I trust that the process by which we choose our president and other leaders will remain free and fair, and that the outcome will represent the will of the people. The hardworking men and women of our intelligence, law enforcement, and national security communities will continue to work tirelessly to ensure that this is the case. And I have every confidence they will succeed in that endeavor. 
it's time to get back to the important work before us and to remember that those we represent are capable of judging for themselves how this impeachment was conducted and maybe just as importantly, how we conducted ourselves as it unfolded. We have a responsibility to lead by example. I implore my colleagues to join me in committing to the getting back to doing the hard and necessary work before us when this impeachment trial reaches its conclusion. And with that, Mr. President, I yield back. President. The Senator from Oklahoma. We're in a third week of the impeachment trial right now. After thousands of documents to be reviewed, over a dozen witnesses that we've heard, and well over a hundred video testimony clips that we've gone through, we're nearing the end. The country is deeply divided on multiple issues right now. And the impeachment trial is both a symptom of our times and another example of our division. The nation didn't have an impeachment inquiry for almost 100 years, until 1868, with the partisan impeachment of Andrew Johnson. Another impeachment wasn't conducted for over 100 years after that, when the House began a formal impeachment inquiry into President Nixon with an overwhelming bipartisan vote of 410 to 4. But just a little over two decades later, there was another partisan impeachment process with President Clinton, when he was impeached on an almost straight partisan vote. Tomorrow, I will join many others in to vote to acquit the President of the United States. His actions certainly do not rise to the level of removal from office. This is clearly another one of our partisan impeachments, now the third in our history. Over the past three years, the House of Representatives has voted four times to open an impeachment inquiry, once in 2017, once in 2018, and twice in 2019. Only the second vote in 2019 actually passed and turned it from into an actual impeachment inquiry. For four months, the country's been consumed with impeachment hearings and investigations. First rumors of issues with Ukraine arose in October, on August the 28th, when Politico wrote a story about U.S. aid being slow walked for Ukraine. And then in September the 18th, when the Washington Post released a story about a whistleblower report that claimed President Trump pressured an unnamed foreign head of state to do an investigation for his campaign. Within days of the Washington Post story, before the whistleblower report came out, before anything was known, Speaker Pelosi announced the House would begin uh, hearings to impeach the president, which led to a formal House vote to open an impeachment inquiry on October the 31st and a formal vote to impeach the president on December the 18th. The House sent over two articles of impeachment asking the Senate to decide if the President should be removed from office and barred from running from any future office in the United States. One on abuse of power, the second on obstruction of Congress. Let me take those two in order. The abuse of power argument hinges on two things. Did the President of the United States use official funds to compel the Ukrainian government to investigate Joe Biden's son and his work for the corrupt natural gas company in Ukraine, Burisma? And did the president withhold a meeting with President Zelensky until President Zelensky agreed to investigate Joe Biden's son? To be clear, the theory of the funds being withheld from Ukraine in exchange for an investigation doesn't originate from that now infamous July the 25th call. There's nothing in the text of the call that threatens the withholding of funds for an investigation. The theory originates from the belief of an ambassador of the European Union, Gordon Sondland's, his, what he said, presumption, and he repeated that over and over again, presumption, that the aid must have been held because of the president's desire to get to the Biden investigation to be able to get it done, since the president's attorney, his private attorney, Rudy Giuliani, was working to find out more about the Biden investigation in Burisma. Ambassador Sondland told multiple people about his theory, but when he actually called President Trump and asked him directly about it, the president responded that there wasn't any quid pro quo. He just said he wanted the president of Ukraine 
to do what he ran on and to do the right thing. Interestingly enough, that's the same thing that President Zelensky said and his defense minister said and his chief of staff said. The aid was held because there was a legitimate concern about the transition of a brand new president in Ukraine in his administration in the early days of his presidency. An, an unknown on the world stage was elected, President Zelensky, on April the 21st. His swearing-in date was May the 21st. During his swearing-in, he also abolished parliament and called for snap elections. No one knew what he was going to do or what this was going to happen or what was going to happen. Those elections happened July the 21st in Ukraine, where an overwhelming number of President Zelensky's party won in parliament. There was an amazing transition in a relatively short period of time in Ukraine. And there were a lot of questions. I would tell you, I was in Ukraine in late May of 2019, and our State Department officials there certainly had questions on the ground on the rapid transition that was happening in Ukraine. It is entirely reasonable for there to be able to be a pause at that time period. Those concerns were resolved by August and early September when the new parliament started passing anti-corruption laws and Vice President Pence sat down face to face with President Zelensky on September the 1st in Poland to discuss their progress on corruption and their progress on getting other nations to help supply more aid to Ukraine. As for the meeting with the president, that being withheld, as I just mentioned, the Vice President of the United States met with President Zelensky on September the 1st. That meeting was originally scheduled to be with the President of the United States, and all the planning had gone into it, and there's documentation for that, that there was a meeting happening between President Zelensky, which is actually the place and date that he asked for, to meet with President Trump. Except in the final moments of that, in the final days leading up to it, Hurricane Dorian approached the United States, and that meeting had to be called off with the president while he stayed here, and so the vice president went in his stead. There was no quid pro quo in a meeting. That meeting that was requested actually occurred. It was interesting to note as well, when I researched the record of past aid dates to Ukraine for the past few years, I found out in 2019 the aid arrived in September. But it's interesting, in 2016 to 2018, the vast majority of military aid each of those years, 2016, 17, and 18, also went to Ukraine in September. While it's easy to create an intricate story on the hold of foreign aid, it's also clear that President Trump has held foreign aid from multiple countries over the last two years, including Afghanistan, Pakistan, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, Lebanon, and others. There's no question that a president can withhold aid for a short period of time, but it has to be released by September the 30th, which it was to Ukraine on time. The hold did occur. There are messages back and forth to be able to hold, but it's entirely reasonable to have the hold, and it was such a short period of time, and the aid arrived at the same time it usually did each of the past three years that the Minister of Defense for Ukraine actually stated that the hole was so short they didn't even know it. What's interesting about this is, this is stretched from not just an abuse of power, but also a quote-unquote obstruction of Congress. That's the second article of impeachment. The House argument was the president didn't turn over every document and allow every witness without submitting everything to Congress immediately. They argued that if the president challenged any subpoena, he was stalling, he was acting guilty, and so it was grounds for impeachment. Remember how fast this all happened. The investigation started September the 24th. The official start of impeachment started October the 31st and ended on December the 18th with a partisan vote in the House for impeachment. If President Trump obstructed Congress because he didn't turn over documents with, uh, that didn't even have a legal subpoena within two months, then I would say President Obama was not impeached, but maybe he should have been, though I don't think he should have been. But if you argue in that same way, because President Obama did not honor legal subpoenas for three years on the Fast and Furious investigation when that happened. Three years he stalled out. But there was no consideration for impeaching President Obama because he shouldn't have been impeached. It was working through the court system as things move. This is a serious issue that became even more serious when the House managers moved not just to say that this is obstruction of Congress if the president doesn't immediately submit, 
but they took this to a different level by saying the president should not have access to the courts at all. Literally stating, does the Constitution give the legislative branch the power to block the executive branch from the judicial branch? House managers said yes. They can rapidly move through a trial, then bring the case to the Senate and have it only partially investigated, and then try to use the power of the Senate to block the executive branch from ever going to court to resolve any issue. That has not been done in the past, nor should it be. The president, like every other citizen in the United States, should have access to the courts. And it is not grounds for contempt of Congress to, not, to block the president from ever trying to go to court to resolve issues that need to be resolved. Every other president's had that right. This one should have had that right as well. This tale that President Trump thinks he's a king and he doesn't want to follow the law begs reality. Let me remind everyone of the Mueller investigation. 2,800 subpoenas that were done over two and a half years. 500 witnesses, including the president's, many of the president's inner circle. All of those were provided. None of those were blocked by the administration. And after two and a half years, the final conclusion was there was no conspiracy between the president's campaign and the Russians. The president did honor those subpoenas. The president's been very clear on multiple court cases that he did not like and did not agree with. He's been outspoken on those, but he's honored each court decision. It would be a terrible precedent for the Senate to remove a president from office because he didn't agree that Congress couldn't take away his rights in court like every other American. The difficulty in this process, as with every impeachment process, is separating out facts and the politics of it. There are facts in this case that we took a lot of time to go through. Each of us in this body sat for hour upon hour upon hour for two and a half weeks listening to testimony, going through the record. We all spend lots of time being able to read on our own through the facts and details. That was entirely reasonable to be able to do. But we have to examine at the end of the day what's a fact-based issue that's been answered. And each of the key facts that were raised by the House all have answers. And what is a politics issue? To say in a, an election year, what is being presented by the House? To say, what can we do to slow down this process and to try to give the president a bad name during the middle of an election time period? To separate those out, out those two is not a simple process. But to begin with the most basic element of, do the facts line up with the accusations made by the House? They do not. Are there plenty of accusations? Yes, there are. And my fear is in the days ahead, there'll be more and more accusations as we go. There have been for the last three years. But at this moment, in the facts of this time, in the partisan rancor from the House and into the Senate, I'm gonna to choose to acquit the President of the United States. This certainly does not rise to the level of removal from office and forbidding him to run for any other office in the future. It certainly doesn't rise to that level. In the days ahead, as more facts come out, all of history will be able to see how this occurred and the details of what happens next. I look forward, actually, to that continuing to be able to come out so all can be known. With that, I yield back. Mr. President. The Senator from Maine. Mr. President, I'd like to share my remarks not only with my colleagues today, but more so with those who will come after us. And I want to touch on four issues. The trial itself, the President's actions as outlined in Articles 1 and 2 of the Articles of Impeachment, and finally, and most importantly in my mind, the implications of our decision this week on the future of our government and our country. First, the trial. Weeks ago, I joined my colleagues in swearing an oath to do impartial justice. And since that time, I've done everything possible to fulfill that responsibility. I've paid full attention, taken three uh, legal pads worth of notes, reviewed press accounts, and had citizens in my home state of Maine. The one question I got most frequently back home was how we could proceed 
without calling relevant witnesses and securing the documents that would confirm or deny the charges against the president, which are at the heart of this matter. But for the first time in American history, we failed to do so. We robbed our record of this president. haunt those who come after us and indeed will haunt the country. But now we're here, left to make this decision without the facts concealed by the White House and left concealed by the votes of this body last Friday. This was not a trial in any real sense. It was instead an argument based upon a partial but still damning record. How much better it could have been had we had access to all the facts, facts which will eventually come out, but too late to inform our decisions. As to the articles of themselves, I should begin by saying I have always been a conservative on the subject of impeachment. For the better part of the last three years, I have argued both publicly and privately against the idea. Impeachment should not be a tool to remove a president on the basis of policy disagreements. The president's lawyers are right when they argue that this would change our system of government and dangerously weaken any president. But this reluctance must give way if it requires my turning a blind eye to what happened last summer. The events of last summer were no policy disagreement. They were a deliberate series of acts <coughs> whereby the president sought to use the power of his office in his own personal and political interest, specifically by pressuring a government of a strategic partner, a partner, by the way, significantly dependent upon our moral and financial support, pressuring that government to take action against one of the president's political rivals and thereby undermine the integrity of the coming American election. And this last point is important. In normal circumstances, the argument of the president's defenders that impeachment is not necessary because the election is less than a year away would be persuasive. I can understand that. But the president in this matter was attempting to undermine that very election and he gives every indication that he will continue to do so. He has expressed no understanding that he did anything wrong, let alone anything resembling remorse. Impeachment is not a punishment, it's a prevention, and the only way, unfortunately, to keep an unrepentant president from repeating his wrongful actions is removal. And this president has made it plain that he will listen to nothing else. Article 1 charges a clear abuse of power in inviting foreign interference with the upcoming election. Inviting foreign interference with the upcoming election. The president tasked his personal attorney to work with a foreign head of state to induce an investigation or just the mere announcement of an investigation that could harm one of the president's top political rivals. And to compel the Ukrainians to do so, he unilaterally withheld nearly $400 million appropriated by Congress to help them fend off Russia's naked and relentless aggression. The president's backers claim that this was done in an effort to root out corruption. So why not use official channels? Why did he focus on no examples of corruption generally other than ones directly affecting his political fortunes? And why did he not make public the withholding of funds, as the executive branch typically does, when seeking to leverage federal monies for policy goals? No matter how many times the president claims, his phone call with President Zelensky was not perfect. It simply wasn't. He clearly solicited foreign interference in our elections. He disregarded a congressionally passed law. He imperiled the security of a key American partner. He undermined our own national security. 
and he was, if he was simply pursuing our national interests rather than his own, why was his personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, put in charge? Why was Rudy Giuliani mentioned in that phone call? Put bluntly, no matter the defense, and as a majority of the members of this body apparently now recognize, President Trump placed his own political interests above the national interests he has sworn to protect. And as I mentioned, he has shown no sign that he'll stop doing so when the next occasion arises, as it surely will. The implications of acquitting the president on Article I are serious. This president will likely do it again, and future presidents will be unbound from any restraints on the use of the world's most powerful political office for their own personal political gain. We are moving dangerously close to an elected monarch, the very thing the framers feared most. Article two to me is even more serious in its long-term implications. Article one concerns an incident, an egregious misuse of power to be sure, but a specific set of actions in time. A scheme is probably the most appropriate description which took place over the course of the past year. Article two, however, which concerns the president's wholesale obstruction of the impeachment process itself, goes to the heart of Congress's congressionally, uh, constitutionally derived power to investigate wrongdoing by this or any future president. I do not arrive at this conclusion lightly. I take seriously the White House counsel's argument that there is a legitimate separation of power issue here, that executive privilege is real, although I have to note it was never actually asserted in this case, but that executive privilege is real and that there must be limits on Congress's ability to intrude upon the executive function. But in this case, Despite counsel's questions about which authorizing resolution passed when or whether the House should have more vigorously pursued judicial remedies, the record is clear and is summarized in the White House letter to the House in early October that the President and his administration, quote, cannot participate in the impeachment process, cannot participate. To me, it is this ongoing blanket refusal to cooperate in any way no witnesses, no documents, no evidence of any kind that undermines the assertion that a categorical refusal with overt witness intimidation thrown in was based upon any legitimate, narrowly tailored legal or constitutional privilege. No prior president has ever taken such a position. And the argument that this blanket obstruction should be tested in court is severely undercut by the administration's recent argument that the courts have no jurisdiction over such disputes and that the remedy for stonewalling Congress is, you guessed it, impeachment. They argued that in the federal court in Washington this week. Interestingly, the first assertion of executive privilege was by George Washington when the House sought background documents on the Jay Treaty. Washington rested his refusal to produce those documents on the idea that the House had no jurisdiction over matters of foreign policy. But interestingly, Washington in his message to Congress did specify one instance where the House would have a legitimate claim on the document's release. Well, instance, you guessed it, impeachment. If allowed to stand this position that the president, any president, can use his or her position to totally obstruct the production of evidence on their, of their own wrongdoing, eviscerates the impeachment power entirely. And it compromises the ongoing authority of Congress to provide any meaningful oversight of the executive whatsoever. For these and other reasons, Mr. President, I will vote guilty on both articles of impeachment. A final point. Madam President, the Congress has been committing slow motion institutional suicide for the past 70 years. 
abdicating its constitutional authorities and responsibilities one by one. The war power, effectively in the hands of the President since 1942. Authority over trade with other countries, superseded by unilateral, presidentially imposed tariffs on friends and foes alike. And even the power of the purse, which a supine Congress ceded to the President last year, enabling him to rewrite our duly passed appropriations bill to substitute his priorities for ours. And now this. The structure of our Constitution is based upon the bedrock principle that the concentration of power is dangerous, that power divided and shared is the best long-term assurance of liberty. To the extent we compromise that principle, give up powers the framers bestowed upon us, and acquiesce to the growth of an imperial presidency, we are failing. We are failing our oaths. We are failing our most fundamental responsibility. We are failing the American people. History may record this week as a turning point in the American experiment, the day that we stepped away from the framers' vision, enabled a new and unbounded presidency, and made ourselves observers rather than full participants in the shape of our country's future. Twenty-fourth, following the prayer and pledge, further that Senator Baldwin be recognized to deliver the address. Without objection. I ask unanimous consent that the Senate recess until 8.25 p.m. tonight, and upon reconvening, proceed as a body to the Hall of the House of Representatives for the joint session of Congress provided under the provisions of H. Conres 86 that upon dissolution of the joint session, the Senate adjourned until 9.30 a.m. Wednesday, February 5th. Finally, following the prayer and pledge, the morning hour be deemed expired, the journal of proceedings be approved to date, and the time for the two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day. Without objection. The Senate stands in recess until 8.25 p.m.